Hey guys, this is Cheryl with Magical Melody, and I'm here with my 24 week prenatal update after bariatric surgery. If you're new to this channel, I had vertical sleeve gastrectomy, which is a weight loss surgery, on January 5th, 2017, with Dr. William Steely at Genova Healthcare. My highest weight was 250.4, day of surgery, 241.4. And at my first prenatal visit, I was 144. Um, the lowest weight that I ever recorded before my prenatal visit was 135.5, but I get into detail as to what happened when I actually reached 135. And even though it was a personal goal for me to reach 135, I didn't stay there for maybe more than three to five days. So, um, today, as of March 15th, 2019, I am 24 weeks pregnant with a baby boy. And I have three older girls. So this is for me going to be my first and also my last baby boy because this is definitely going to be my last pregnancy. Um, at the prenatal visit today, everything went really well. Um, his heart rate was really well, but I don't remember right off what um, he said it was. I apologize. Um, so everything was really well. Um, on week 28, they want me to go back in and have a lot of lab work done. And they mentioned that they wanted me to go through the blood glucose tolerant test, which I kind of explained to them, well, since I'm a bariatric patient, I'm not going to be able to tolerate that drink. And there's been a lot of issues with people who have had bariatric surgery and having to take the blood glucose tolerant test. Like it's not good. There's been people who have gotten really sick and then passed out. Um, just a bunch of stuff that I really don't feel like is worth the risk of putting myself through and it's not worth the risk of risking my baby for me to be that sick over a blood sugar test when there's other things that you can do to determine if I have gestational diabetes, which I probably don't have gestational diabetes. <laughs> I mean, let's be realistic. <laughs> um, so I have that. Um, at my last prenatal appointment, I was 161, and today I am 166, which for me, I'm a little disappointed with that. I think that um, even though it's only five pounds to gain within a month, um, I just feel like that that's a little much. I wish it would have been a little bit less. Um, so, you know, I'm always trying to work hard to tweak my diet and tweak the things that I'm doing um, to help me make sure that I'm eating healthy and to make sure that the weight gain that I'm gaining is related to the baby and not because um, I'm just gaining ridiculous weight. Um, I mean, when you're pregnant, I know that there's going to be some weight gain, but... For me, I just want to make sure that it's baby and not fat. Because um, I know that it's very easy to slip back into um, old habits, especially when you're pregnant. You have hormonal changes in your body. You crave a lot of bad foods. You Everything. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, let me see. My first, like... So, on total, um, as of today, I've gained 22 pounds um, in a little bit more than halfway through my pregnancy. I just personally think that's a little bit too much weight. I would have liked to have not gained any um, weight or maybe one to two pounds minimal during this month, but that didn't happen. So... I'm just going to try and see what I can do. Um, 
I drink a lot of protein shakes, so what I thought that I would try and do is um, switch back to almond milk just to help avoid extra calories and extra carbohydrates and whatnot from the milk. I do drink fat for your skin, but that's 80 calories for every eight ounces and 11 grams of carbs for every eight ounces. But the thing is, whenever you have a protein shake and a shaker bottle, you're getting like 12 to 24 ounces of milk. So I'm actually consuming a lot more calories than just the 80 calories out of the regular serving for eight ounces and a lot more carbohydrates. So taking that into account, I think um, that probably what would help me if I was switched back to almond milk um, or that nut milk that Silk makes um, to make sure that I'm not getting so many calories and so many carbs. So that is one problem that I think that I'm having. Um, with, with the weight gain because I have had to resort to drinking at least two protein shakes a day to kind of ward off some of the hunger because what I was noticing was happening, I was hungry all the time. I mean, like, all I wanted to do was eat, 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 eat. Like, oh my God, when am I gonna stop needing to eat? Like, I get, I get it. Like, I have a really small stomach. I can't eat that much at one time. And I have a growing human inside of me, and I, um, it's probably gonna make me more hungry and make me wanna eat more. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, how can this be healthy? Because for us, eating like a six ounce plate of food is just as bad as going out to like Applebee's and eating a really big meal with steak and and, and shrimp and mashed potatoes, you know? So I mean, it's, it's process different for us is like eating very little but eating a lot is not much for us so i mean i'm just trying to watch because you know I, I wish that i could just sit back and not worry about it and completely enjoy this pregnancy and just wrap my whole head around being pregnant but at the same time i did just have a surgery um a couple of years ago that removed more than half of an organ to make me lose weight um, and it was very difficult for me to go through that and um, it's been a lot of work for me to actually get the weight off after that and to be put in a position where I'm constantly gaining weight and it's pretty much out of my control um, is it, kind of mind-boggling um, and I am noticing that I can still wear some of my actually not some of my I can actually wear all of my pre-pregnancy clothes still um, I just switched to maternity pants just because they're more comfortable but I really didn't need to do that I just chose to um, because I found some on sale at Walmart for like 11 and 13 dollars a pair so I got like five pairs of jeans um, and then I bought some used maternity clothes from a lady uh, and out of that, I got like two pairs of jeans and a pair of capris out of, you know, I just kind of got lucky there. But I mean, otherwise I didn't have to buy maternity clothes. And I don't understand that because it's like, well, where's all the weight going? Like I gained all this weight so far, but I'm still able to fit my pre-pregnancy clothes. Like, I don't, I don't understand. And it's really screwing me up in my head. Um, and I really am um, dealing big time with the whole body dysmorphia thing because um, sometimes when I look in the mirror, I'm seeing a really big fat person. Like I see that big 250 pound fat girl looking back at me that I used to be. Um, and it's really haunting it really is just it's like look at that and i find that usually if i take pictures of myself in clothes that i used to wear before i got pregnant and i take pictures of myself pictures don't lie then i look back at those pictures and i look back at the pictures um of when i was smaller like right before i got pregnant it makes me see 
that even though I have gained some weight because of obviously being pregnant, that I'm not that big. I don't look as bad as what my mind thinks that I am. So that's what I'm doing to try and help myself get through that. Um, and just try and remind myself that because I have had the surgery, it's gonna make it um, 10 times more easier for me to lose the weight after having the baby than it otherwise would. Um, if you watched any of my previous videos, you know that I never lost any of the weight since you know, after I had a baby. I just either kept gaining or just didn't lose what I gained. Um, <laughs> so it is what it is. So um, the ultrasound that I had was March the 4th, which was two days before my birthday. Um, me and my husband went and the baby looks really good. His heartbeat that day was 174 beats per minute. Um, he went from at the 18 month ultrasound being a half a pound to at 22 and a half weeks being a pound and a half. So um, he's, he's growing quite a bit. Um, and earlier today, I was leaning over like this at the doctor's office and he was actually kicking and he was like kicking me in my ribs because I was leaning over. Like he was kicking the bottom of my ribs, like right there. I don't know if you can actually see it because I have him sitting. But anyway, um, yeah, so he's doing well. Okay, so I did some re research on the whole thing with the uh, placenta previa they said I had at 18 weeks. And one of the things that I learned is really the best way to diagnose previa and diagnose how bad your previa is, is for them to do a transvaginal ultrasound. So I asked, I told them, I said, first off, I don't even know how bad the previa is because they didn't tell me when I was down in Nashville, like, was it marginal, was it partial, or was it total? And Secondly, based on what I've been able to find on it with the information that I found is really to be able to determine that accurately, you have to do a transvaginal ultrasound um, to see exactly and like get exact measurements where it is. So if it's possible, I would like to either do that today or the next time I come in. She said, well, the last time that you were seen at 18 weeks, your ultrasound, then you had total previa. I was like, wow, they didn't even tell me that. You had total previa. And she says, normally for total previa, we don't do transvaginal ultrasounds because, you know, obviously with the whole pelvic rest thing, you're not supposed to have anything inside your vagina because it can cause your placenta to bleed. Um, so basically she's looking around and she's a little, it looks like everything's all moved out of the way and everything's cool. So she said, you know, but um, let's be sure. Um, I will do this transvaginal and we will find out exactly what's going on. So she came back in the room and started looking around. And immediately she said, oh, no, no, you still have total previa. It's completely the cervix. The, the placenta is completely covering your cervix still. And then I said well, where is my placenta? Like, where did it attach on my uterus, uterus wall? Was it anterior, which means like, anterior means like, they basically, anterior is like, here you have placenta, then baby. Or sometimes it can be like off on either side. I don't remember what that was called. But then posterior is like where you have baby, then placenta. So the placenta attached to the back wall of my uterus. And it's, it's so low that it's actually covering my cervix. So I, I kind of found out in doing some, you know, reading and whatnot, I found some videos on YouTube about it too. It's basically said that when your um, placenta is posterior, it, um, there's not really much of a change with the previa um, because of that, because your placenta doesn't move 
once it's attached, it's attached. But what makes it change is because you're, as your uterus grows and as the baby grows, that's what makes it not any longer cover, you know, your cervix. Because as the baby grows and your stomach comes out more this way, it makes it like so that it's completely gone. Um, so today I asked the doctor, I said, well, gosh, I said, you know, at what point are we going to just give up on this and just schedule a cesarean section? He said, like, when it gets to around, you know, that you're around 35 weeks, 36 weeks, and it's still there like it is now. I mean, he said, but right now, though, we have plenty of time. And he said, most of the time, previews resolve themselves. Um, and that he really wants to wait and see what's going to happen. Um, because I've had three other very successful vaginal births and they really want me to have a vaginal birth with this as, as well, which I want that too. I don't want a C-section. I really don't like that idea at all because I mean, it's already bad enough having a newborn baby and having to deal with that. And in my case, four to six weeks after he's born, have to deal with having to have him have eye surgery. Um, Having to recover from a C-section is just one more added extra stress that I really would rather not have to um, deal with because cesarean section is kind of risky because just like any surgery, any surgery is risky, but this is like they're cutting your stomach open, you know, and it's a major surgery and there's risks involved with that. And I just w would rather not have to go through that. <laughs> So I told him, I said, well, you know, I'd, I'd like the idea of vaginal birth too. I said, yeah, but I, I want to get fixed. You know, I want to get my tubes tied after I have this baby. And he said, well, then if that's the case, we'll just do it, you know, laparoscopically, like right after you have the baby, you know, there's a way they can do it vaginally, you know, I mean, un unless they end up needing a C-section, then they would do it that way. But, um... I don't know how much of a likelihood it is for me to be able to have a vaginal birth with this. I hope it can happen. Um, I'm not saying that it won't happen, but based on the information that I was given so far, um, it's not as likely, you know, but I guess anything's possible. So, you know, he says that they usually resolve themselves so i guess we'll see we'll see you know because I, like i don't want to wind up in an emergency type situation and have to run in for a c-section based on an emergency because i start bleeding um or things like that um i don't know that kind of scares me a little bit because for one thing um, me and kyle don't have family who live here um, so, uh, we're not really equipped to deal with an emergency type situation like that because my kids, um, would have to stay home if I had to have a C-section because kids aren't, you know, they're not going to be allowed in there with a C-section. So if, if that happened like that with an emergency, then I'm not sure what we would do for that. Um. If I have a vaginal birth, then they can still be there and everything will be fine. Um, I am working on trying to get some family here to stay with me throughout the last month of my pregnancy. So, like, from um, the beginning part of June um, through the beginning or mid part of July. Just because toward the end, you never know um, what day the baby's actually going to come. It could be any day. It could happen any time. So, um, I would feel a little bit more comfortable if I had family here. So, I'm working on trying to get, like, somebody to come here to be able to step in if something like that should happen. But, I, I mean, I really hope it doesn't. I hope it, I hope it moves. I hope I get to have a vaginal birth because this is my last one. I'm not going to get to experience that again. 
Um, and I honestly thought that when I had Michaela, that she was going to be my last one. And, you know, I didn't get fixed. I just said, well, don't worry about it. You know, there's no point. It's just an extra surgery. Um, because they were going to fix me back then with the laparoscopic thing. But then they couldn't do it because a resident from UA or Mastone in Little Rock, Arkansas is the one who um, delivered my baby. It wasn't the doctor who delivered her. The resident's not allowed to perform any kind of surgery. So they said, well, um, the resident's going to deliver your baby today. So you can't do that. You're going to have to go back um, a whole separate time and to have it done. So he was going to do it for me at my six-week, you know, follow-up postpartum exam. Well, they scheduled her eye surgery for the same day. So I ended up not doing it. And then I said, well, I'll go back. Then I thought I was thinking about it. I was like, no, don't worry about it. Because then that's just an extra surgery. And it's just a bunch of extra stress. And la di da di da -dee. Don't worry about it. Just leave it alone. Things will be fine. Yeah. Should have got fixed. <laughs> I mean, I don't regret being pregnant or having another baby. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's just, you know. I should have, I guess, followed my gut back then because something kept nagging at me in the back of my mind of go get fixed, go do that thing, go do that thing. I'm like, no, 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 it's not necessary. I don't worry about it. Just leave it alone. Yes. <laughs> so I kind of wish I would have now because Michaela, um, right around the time the baby is born, um, it's like a week, week and a half-ish. After his due date, she turns 10. So there's quite a bit of age difference going on. Um, that scares me a little bit, the age difference. Um, so, yeah. Um, I did go out and um, get my hair cut. Kyle got me a haircut for my birthday. And I posted some pictures of it on Instagram. Um, that's what it looks like. Today when I straightened it, the front part, it wanted to act funny, so I just kind of tucked it behind my ears. Um, and it's kind of one of those cuts that's like longer in the front than is in the back. And um, at the first of the month, I'm going to go have it highlighted. So, um, I'm going to try and have it done before my April 4th ultrasound so that um, probably the next time that you see me on here, I'll have highlights in my hair. I haven't had highlights in years. Um, actually, I've never had highlights. I always went like completely blonde, but it always made me look like really um, washed out because blonde is a little bit just too light for somebody like me who has warm skin tones. Um, blonde looks better whenever you have like cooler skin tones than what I do. So it's pretty hard for me to wear blonde. Um, so I'm going to try and um, do some highlights and see how that goes. I, I just like to do something different, you know. Summer's coming and I just got tired of like the dark, really dark violet reds and burgundies. Um, and stuff like that. So, um, that, that's, that's really, you know, all I can think of for this video. If you did like it, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you're new to this channel and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.